When I say the word disciple, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Disciple. Maybe for some, it's the famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci, Jesus and his disciples uh, around the table. Disciple. You know, for some, uh, the word seems a little scary. If I was to ask you the question, are you a disciple of Jesus? I think some people would be, uh, mm, oh, I, mm, I don't think I've reached quite that level. Yes, that's, that's a different status than what I normally think of. For some, the word disciple is a little mysterious, but honestly, if we took the time just to look it up in the dictionary, this is what we're told a disciple is, is a follower or a student of a teacher. That's a disciple. He's a follower or student of a teacher. So when I say I'm a disciple of Jesus, really what I'm saying is I'm a student. I'm a student of a teacher. And as a student, let me just say, I don't always get it right. Students don't always get it right. Sometimes students show up for class and they forget their pen and paper. Sometimes students show up in class and they hear the teacher speaking. It goes in one ear and out the other ear. So students have, it's not anything about uh, being perfect in class. In fact, we talked about that as the Christian life. The Christian life is about progress and not perfection. As a student, we, we are always constantly learning. It's learning because we're a student of a teacher. That teacher just happens to be Jesus. And it's never about reaching perfection, but it is about progress in my life. And I, I be, I'm going to admit, I, I have a, a long list of mess ups because maybe I wasn't paying attention to the teacher or I just chose to do something that the teacher was instructing me. So I'm so thankful that the Christian life is not about perfection because if it was about perfection, I would be in deep doo doo for sure. I know that's not a word that farmers normally use, but the one I prefer to use here in Tilsonburg. Okay, can I um, read though uh, a verse for you? This is a verse that I read this week, and to be quite honest, I've read it before, uh, but it encouraged me, and it surprised me all at the same time. Uh, and it's found in Matthew chapter 28. Now, if you kind of grew up in the church and, and the Bible's quite familiar with you, you might go, oh, Matthew 28, yeah, I know what that's all about. That's all about where Jesus, before he sends up to heaven, gives the Great Commission. Uh, in fact, this is what Jesus says just before he arises and he goes up to heaven. He says, go into all the world and make disciples. Well, we're familiar with this, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and of teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Okay, we're familiar with that. But it's those verses that are just above that verse that stood out to me this week. In fact, not only did it stood out to me, not only did it surprise me, but it really did encourage me. Here's the verse right before it. It says, then the 11 disciples, 11, I thought there were 12 disciples. Do you remember? Judas has hung himself, so he's no longer part of the group. And Jesus had instructed the disciples where they were to go to meet him. So it says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Simple. I understood that. I remember that. It says, when they saw him, they worshiped him. Got it? Makes sense. The disciples show up. They're seeing the resurrected Jesus. Natural response would be, yeah, worship him. But the verse goes on and it says, but. And you're like, but what? They saw him. They worshiped him. But, but what? It's the next two, verse, two words that really actually encouraged me. It said, but... Some doubted. What? How does one doubt you are standing in the presence of the resurrected Jesus? What is there to doubt? I mean, remember, these are the guys who have traveled with Jesus for about three years um, all over Israel. They have shared a meal together. They've done life together. They are a band of brothers. They are the ones who literally saw Jesus crucified. They saw him put into the tomb. They saw the tomb being sealed. Then they came back and the, and the stone was gone and the, empty, the tomb was empty. And now they're standing in the presence of the resurrected Jesus. And it says, and some doubted. 
I'm like, if, if the disciples, not a disciple, but if the disciples still are learning, I feel like I'm in pretty good company. Because remember, it's not about perfection. It's about progress. It's about learning in our faith. And so here's a, a group of men who have been traveling with Jesus their whole life. And they still got questions. The teacher stands in front of them, and they have all kinds of questions. And so what we're learning from the book of James is really is how to be a better disciple. How to be a better student of Jesus. We are in week three of our series that we have entitled, Be Real. We're just taking some time, our time, walking through the book of James, a small little book at the end of the New Testament, five chapters, 108 verses, and the book really helps us to know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, interesting to note that most scholars today believe that James is actually the oldest letter in the New Testament. Sometimes we read the New Testament and we think, oh, it's Matthew's first and Mark and Luke and John. But James, most scholars believe, was written like 5, 10, 20 years before the Gospels and before the 13 epistles that the Apostle uh, Paul writes. So this, this is uh, the oldest book that we have. It's amazing that we have a copy of a letter that's 2,000 years old. And I find it fascinating that we have a book that is written by the half-brother of Jesus who most of his life doubted who Jesus was. And here it has been preserved uh, for us today. And what James does, actually, he, he echoes a Jesus teaching. Now, James only mentions Jesus twice in the book of uh, James. And so maybe you, because of that, you might lean toward to think, well, James is more of a, um, you know, it's a, a book that's just a moralistic uh, book, but doesn't have any deep roots in the teachings of Jesus. But really, James is a commentary on all that Jesus was teaching. If you were to take time and look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and you read that, and then you came over and read the book of James, you'd go, oh, he kind of expands on everything that Jesus talked about. In particular, the verses that we're going to look at today kind of wraps up what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon of the Mount, uh, of Mount. Now, the overall concern of James is that Christians would walk in a way uh, that would be following Jesus even amid persecution because James is actually quite deeply concerned about the church that circumstances are causing them to live and act in a way that is not how Jesus has taught now if you remember if you remember the book of Job and all the conflict that Job went through and the heartache and his friends came along and his friends were so good when they never opened up their mouth remember that like they were great encouragers they just sat with him didn't say anything for a whole week but then they opened their mouth and it all went downhill from there so in that culture, in the Jewish culture, the idea was bad things only happen to people who have sin in their life. So the Jewish culture was when, when life is good, the reason God blesses you is because you're doing, you're doing everything you're supposed to do. But if something bad happens, then you go, okay, something's wrong in that family's life or that person's life. That's what they that would think. So you can imagine, we got a first generation of all these Christians who were living in Jerusalem who now are on the run because of persecution. So, you, so they got this mindset. The old mindset is, well, we must be doing something wrong because persecution is coming our way because God doesn't persecute those if you're following him. So you can understand why there's a little bit of conflict in the minds of these first generation believers. But then I'm reminded that in Matthew, when Matthew was even teaching Again, on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 11, Jesus made this comment, blessed are you when men persecute you. And you're like, okay, Jesus, that makes no sense. So when the teacher is teaching, you know, sometimes you maybe you've sat in a class and the teacher makes a comment and you're like, that makes absolutely no sense at all. I don't understand one thing he just said. So I can imagine those who are hearing some of the stuff from the Sermon on the Mount are in the same situation. God, this doesn't make any sense at all. Jesus, I, what are you trying to say? So we have these first-generation Christians who are living through persecution, and, and James is really concerned of how they're living and what they're, what they're thinking with, because he knows they're probably struggling with this whole idea, because life is not going as easy as they thought it would be when you follow Jesus. 
James is a little concerned that people are building their life on sand and not on a rock. And so what we do is we kind of get a front row seat of what Jesus is really teaching from this book of James. He's addressing an issue. Really what he's trying to describe is what a genuine follower of Jesus looks like. That's what he's doing. As I said, James doesn't talk about perfection. He, he talks about progress. He, he's saying that there needs to be some changes in your life when you decide to follow Jesus. I mean, the way that you and I acted 10 years ago when we first came to know Christ, you would think that it would be a little different than five years ago or three years ago or two years ago. Like, you would think there'd be some progress that we are growing up in our faith, that we're maturing in our faith, that we're not staying as toddlers, that we're different, that our, that our lives are being changed along the way. And so James is concerned that there are people who have a faith, but it's not a real faith. And that's what he's dealing with. And he says they deceive others, and the truth is they deceive themselves to think they have something that they don't have. Anyone recognize um, this guy right here? Oh, thank you very much. That was very kind of you. Did you tell that something's wrong with me? I mean, more than mental. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Anybody recognize this guy? Okay, how about this? If I tell you he was born in April 27th, 1948, does that help? Okay. Uh, he's actually quite famous. Um, what about that? Tell you his name. His name is Frank William Abnail Jr. That should give it away, right? Yeah. He was born in, um, uh, where was he born? He was born in uh, New York in New Rochester. He was educated in a very strict religious school. He was born to a very affluent family. And he soon developed a reputation as a con artist. His first victim was his own father. He scammed them out of $3,400. He, as a teenager, he had the ability to print perfectly payroll checks and then deposit them in his own account. I, I love this story about him. He noticed that the United Airlines and Hertz rental car that they both use at the end of the night the same safety deposit box you know, the night where you go and you put your money in and then you go home? He noticed that they both dropped their money off there. So what he did at 19 years of age, he went to the costume store and rented a security guard's outfit and put on the safety deposit box, out of order, please leave with security guard. Clever, I thought. He presented himself as a federal aviation pilot and forged his pilot's license and with Pan American World Airlines, and he flew on over 250 flights. He managed to get a job at Bingham Young University as a sociology professor. For 11 months, Frank impersonated himself as the chief resident pediatric doctor in a Georgia hospital. Frank forged a Harvard University law transcript posed as a lawyer and got a job at the Louisiana State Attorney General's office. Did that at 19 as well. He took an identity of a prison inspector for the Bureau of Prisons. He impersonated and conned people into believing he was an FBI agent. And after almost getting caught, he made his way to Canada. And at the Dorval Airport, the RCMP recognized him, arrested him, and sent him back to the U.S. He did that all by the age of 23 years. He was a con. He was the king of con. He looked the part, but there was absolutely no reality. He was a fraud. He was a fake. He was a forgery. He only looked the part, but he wasn't the real deal. And after only serving a third of his sentencing in prison, guess what? He was released on the condition that he would work for the FBI. <laughs> and help them catch other con artists. And he's been doing it for 40 years, teaching and training the FBI. In 2002, they made a movie called uh, Catch Me If You Can. I don't know if you remember this or not, but Leonardo there, he was one that acted in, in the movie. I have a friend of mine, 
His name is Ken. Uh, he is an undercover FBI agent in Washington, D.C. And um, he does a lot of um, high-profile stuff. And uh, I remember one time he said, I was down in South America, and I was living the life of a very wealthy exporter-importer. And I was trying to make my way into the cartel. And he said, you know, when you live a lavish lifestyle for almost a year, living in the penthouses, trying to make contacts with some of the upper people of the cartel, after a year, when you live that way, and you spend like you have all kinds of money, you start thinking you are that person. Like, you, you actually begin to deceive yourself that you are a, a wealthy person living the high life. Well, what James is trying to tell us that there is a difference between being a follower, a, a disciple of Jesus, and just a fan of Jesus. Like, to, he's, he's trying to say there's authentic Christians, but then there are fake ones. There, there are those that look like it, and sometimes they even sound like it, but they're not real. And the thing is, every church, every church has those who are authentic Christians and those who have a faith, but it doesn't seem to really transform their lives. And, and sometimes I think people deceive themselves that they have a genuine faith, but it's not genuine because it really is causing no transformation in their life. There, there's a big difference between Christian and, and authentic Christianity. And James speaks so clearly, like there's no confusion as to what he is saying. He's a straight shooter. He doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't talk high and mighty in the sky. He just meets us where we are down on Main Street. And James is telling us how we can actually take our faith to the streets, just like the Doobie Brothers sing it. Taking it to the streets. Anybody know that song? Or am I the oldest person in the room? Yeah, it might be. Okay. James is saying there's, there's a big difference between talking the lingo and living that lingo. So what does James have for us? Well, I'm going to say that maybe we, maybe we should brace ourselves may cause us to squirm a little bit. may cause some beads of sweat to come down our foreheads. You may find suddenly you have to get up and go get a glass of water. The temperature may arise a little bit as we read these verses this morning. So if you have your Bibles, it's James chapter 1. We're going to pick up in James chapter 1, verse 19. James 1, 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. And slow to become angry. Yeah, that makes, that's good common sense right there, I think. For man's anger does not bring about righteousness, a righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, that all sounds straightforward. Then he comes to verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says was like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Anybody recognize this logo? Hello, anybody out there? What is it? Nike, right? This is the Nike lo- logo. Anybody know what the like, Nike slogan is? Just do it. Nike has made billions of dollars on this slogan, just do it. And you may think to yourself, that slogan was probably invented in some downtown executive office in New York City somewhere. But no, we find it right here in the book of James. That's what his whole slogan is. Just do it. You've heard it. Now just do it. What what does that mean? That that means application. It's all about the application. So uh, Nike is saying, get the equipment and then go do it. Get the shorts, get the t-shirts, get the sneakers, and then get running. Get the skates, get skating. Get the tennis racket, get the sneakers, and get out on that court. Like, do it. It's, It's all about application and that's what he's talking about it's one thing to have the equipment it's another thing actually to go ahead and do it 
So as James says, application is going to be the key. You hear the word of God, now do, just do it. Just go out and do it. It's, it's, it's about taking you know, all the Christian stuff that you know and the data and the principles and you apply it to your life and you do something with it. See, it's easy to explain it, but it's sometimes a little bit different to live it, to live it out. So it's about application. That's what it means. James says to have a deep and a maturing faith, you've you got to put into action what you hear from God's word. And I understand that today's message is, is kind of a little more geared toward those who are, you know, um, a follower of Christ. And you may be here, you're just kind of checking things out. You know, I don't know if, this, if I really believe this. I want to see if it's real or not. And um, that's okay. Because what's this going to do? When you decide to become a Christian, when God does open your eyes to who you are, you'll know what an authentic Christian looks like. Plus, it also helps you to distinguish between who is real, like what is a real Christian, an authentic Christian, versus who is just what we say sometimes, a Christian this morning. How many um, have played hockey here? Anybody play soccer? Play soccer? Okay. Well, you know, and I found that in Canada, years ago anyway, if you can walk, then you're, you put skates on that little boy or girl. And so I, I played hockey since the first time I think I can make my first step. I got my skates and went to hockey schools and uh, played hockey every summer, played it all during the school year, went to hockey power skating classes, did the whole thing. So I played defense for a lot of years, and then my last couple of years I moved up to being a forward. And now you just imagine, picture this, okay, so I'm a defenseman, I got, my, I got the puck, I got the stick, and I'm behind the goaltender's net, and I'm kind of looking which way should I go, and I finally pull out on one side, and I'm skating up toward the blue line, I see the forward, is open, I pass the puck to the forward, he gets the puck, and he stands there. So I, I, I think, well, what is, what's he doing? So the, the next time, you know, I'm, I'm coming up again, and I pass it to the forward, and, and he's got it. He's got the puck, and he's doing nothing with it. He doesn't continue skating. He doesn't pass it on to anybody. He just stops, and then you start thinking, okay, we're losing games here. We're, we're not winning anything because he received the puck. He had it, but he doesn't do anything with it. You think, well, that's crazy. That's the craziest thing that I've ever heard. Well, the same as what James is saying. We receive the word of God. We got the word of God. It's been passed on to us, and we got it, and we stop. We don't do anything with it. And that's what James is trying to get at. That when, when you receive the word, you do something with it. I mean, you can imagine if that had been Wayne Gretzky's strategy just to receive the puck and not do anything with it. Many Christians, many of us, there's been times I'm guilty, by the way. I receive something, I learn something, but I don't do anything with it. Last week I said, I try to make it clear that a vertical relationship must have a horizontal expression for people to see that this relationship is real. It does get played out on this level here. So a vertical relationship must have a horizontal expression, which goes on to say, faith needs works to remain vibrant. It's not works that's going to get you to heaven. It's not works that's going to save you. No, no. But it makes your faith more vibrant when you live out what's been given to you from God's word. God created us to live in this world, but not to love the world. And sometimes we get more in love with the world than the person who created the world. The world was given to us as a gift to go and enjoy it, but not to enjoy it more than the, the giver of the gift. I mean, you can imagine a young lady, she gets her diamond ring she's proposed to, and the guy saves up all of his life savings, and he buys this ring, and she gets this ring, and it's beautiful, it's breathtaking. 
And all she ever does is talk about the ring. Oh, it's a beautiful sparkle. I love it. I love it. But never talks about the person that gave it to her. You begin to think, huh. Or, you know, you're at the wedding and there's the vows. Hey, do you promise to, you know, to love, love him? And you go, I promise to love this all my life. I promise to take care of it. In sickness and health, I promise to look after it. Now you think, okay. And so, in the same sense, you know, we're not to be more in love with the world than the person who gave it to us, who created us and gave it to us as a gift. I think James is a little is a concern that sometimes as Christians we get more in love with the world than the one who gave us to enjoy it. And James is trying to tell us, like, once the word has been implanted, it, it's supposed to transform you. It, it, it transforms your life. It transforms your conversations. It transforms your conduct. It just transforms you, transforms your compassion. So what's the bottom line? Here's the bottom line. Genuine faith goes from listening to living. That's what James is just basically saying. Somewhere along the line, it's got to go from listening to, to living. Now, I understand in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it tells us faith begins by listening. You know that, that verse, so faith comes from hearing the word of God, right? Hearing the good news. That's where it all starts. I hear it, I receive it. But that's where it begins. I can't just end there. And that's what James is trying to tell us. Genuine faith goes from listening, hearing. Yes, that's where it started. But it's got to be translated into how I live. It just can't stop with the hearing and the listening. And, and reasons that go beyond that is because in verse 22, when it talks about there, don't merely listen to the word because you'll begin to deceive yourself. If you're only listening, the truth is we're, we're fooling ourselves. I mean, it's one thing to fool others, but it's a whole new level when you deceive yourselves. Uh, A.W. Tozer, an old uh, theologian from days gone by, made this comment. Of all forms of deception, self-deception is the most deadly. And of all the deceived persons, the self-deceived are the least likely to discover the fraud. So when we deceive ourselves, we're, we're the least likely to even discover it. We don't even see it. I mean, how many times have we you know, have a really good friend and, you, and, and they have this blind spot and they just don't see it at all. And that's what James is saying. Like that's, you know, we deceive ourselves into thinking we are something uh, that we're not. Genuine faith changes how you live. Genuine faith changes how you live. If it's not real in your private life, it's not going to be real in your public life. What happens, it becomes a little more of a, of a show, uh, but not the authentic faith that James is talking about here. As in verse 23, he uses the illustration as a mirror. What does a mirror do? The mirror gives us information about ourselves. So we look in the mirror and we see something is you know, hanging from our nose. We do something about it. That's just what we do. Nobody's going to look in the mirror and realize, Ooh, I should correct that, and then not do anything and walk away. Well, that's what the Word of God is. It's like a mirror. It kind of it gives us information about ourselves. But then we're to do something with it. The mirror exposes and maybe, maybe um, this morning you find yourself consumed with maybe self or lust, or maybe you find yourself careless with your words, obsessed with social media or what people think of you, or maybe you're just not truthful with your financial dealings. For most of us, here's the truth. It's not a knowing problem. It's a doing problem. Most of us know what to do. Let me tell you. I grew up in a Christian home. I have Christian parents, Christian great-grandparents, Christian great-great-grandparents. My parents sent me to a Christian school. I went to a Bible college. Then I went to a Christian university. Uh, then I went to seminary. Like, I, I got all the know. I got it. I got tons of know. My problem has always been this doing part. 
I, I feel like Don Collar knows a lot. His struggles right here is part two. It's, it's the doing. So it's not, a, it's a not a knowing problem that we have. It's a doing problem. It's not an information problem. It's an application problem. You know, sometimes um, I've been at churches where we're just heavy. We're heavy into classes. You know, learn, 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 which I'm nothing against learning. But every now and then, I would say to myself, I feel like we've learned a lot. Maybe we should put into practice what we've learned. Because sometimes we get so full of head knowledge, but it doesn't ever get lived out. I, I remember the first time when I was, uh, in, Bi- when I was in Bible college, uh, one of the things they wanted us to do was to go and share your faith out in the streets of New York City. I'm like, oh, I can't do it. I knew the stuff to say, but I'm like, oh, that's, that's, whoa, that's way out of my comfort zone. No, no, I, don't, I can't do that stuff. And all of a sudden, like, my faith was just being so stretched because I, I knew what I needed to say, but I was really struggling to go out and do something to share my faith. And then sometimes when you step out in those areas of faith, it's like, wow, God really begins to transform you. And you see God in a brand new way. It's like, wow, God, I never, I never thought you'd show up like that. And he does. And here's my question. When you listen and obey, you can count on God's blessing. That's what it says in verse 25. When you hear and you listen and you do, because God blesses you. So I guess my question is, in your reading of God's word or listening on a tape or a CD, what's God telling you? Like, what's God telling you? Like this week, what has he shown you? That maybe you need to now take what you've heard and seen. It's now maybe time to take the next step and do. And when that happens, James says, blessed is the man who does it. Let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for our time. Lord, this little book is packed, my goodness, it's packed with stuff that is life-changing. I'm so grateful that you have preserved this little book for us to learn from. Lord, and I am, there's no way I'm going to stand up here and give any impression that I always, always do what I'm told to do, because I don't. But Lord, there is something about following you and doing you that changes our lives. We are blessed. So Lord, I, um, I just pray that as a church congregation, as a church family, oh, wouldn't that be awesome? Be characterized as a church who, who doesn't just know God's word, but they actually live out God's word. That's, that's what I want to be. I want to be a student who lives out what the teacher says. And I know God is challenging at times, very challenging at times, actually. And Lord, sometimes as students, we fail, and we come back to the teacher, and we have to learn the lesson again. So God, help us to be authentic and genuine in our faith, that it sees, people can see that actually has transformed us. We are not what we once were. You are molding and shaping us to be completely different. And help us to be reminded, look, God, it's not about perfection, but it is about progress. Our lives are changing. To be a little bit more like you today than we were yesterday. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.